Another problem is irrelevant features. So an ML system will only be capable of learning if the training data contains enough relevant features and not too many irrelevant features. So uh, there's something called feature engineering, which is crucial to really master for to be you know a proper data scientist or machine learning engineer is coming up with a good set of features to train on. So you might be given data that has a lot of features. So it looks like you have a lot of data. But when it comes to predicting your outcome variable, not all of this data might be directly correlated with the outcome. So a lot of it might be extra. For example, in the case of, you know, predicting the price of the car, they could supply us, you know, we said that we could have, have a data set, you know, with the car mileage, the model, its age, and so on and so forth. You could also provide data on the weather the day that car was created or manufactured, right? But that doesn't really have any correlation with the outcome. You know, the weather the day the car was manufactured should not play any part in the price of the car. So if we have that in the data set, we should remove that. We should not include that as part of the training data because we might actually be tricking the model into thinking that that variable is relevant. So it might actually find a relationship, but this re relationship is bogus. Like we know that it's, it's not possible, but the model is not that smart. So feature engineering involves feature selection, which is selecting the most useful features to train on among existing features and feature extraction, combining existing features to produce a more useful one. So like we mentioned earlier, dimensionality reduction, algorithms can help with this and also creating new features by gathering new data. So let's say that we want to predict the price of a car and we're given the model and we're given the age and the mileage. And then we, we also think that the company, you know, that produced the or manufactured the car would also be important for predicting the price. We don't know the company, it's not included in the data, but we do know the model of the car. So we can go and we can search the models individually and find the companies that those models belong to and inc include that as a new column within the data. So that's an example of creating new features by gathering new data. So as long as you think that a new feature might be correlated with an outcome variable, it's worth the effort and time to go and do that. So feature engineering is very important to do. And often the best models and the best solutions to problems come from the feature engineering. You can hypothetically take a bunch of data and throw it into a machine learning algorithm and expect some sort of result, you know, some sort of accuracy, even though it might be a low accuracy, right? But the more time you spend in feature engineering and the higher the accuracy of the model is going to be. And sometimes it makes or breaks the solution you know, the ingenuity or the creativeness that one puts in each engineering stage of a problem is what actually makes that algorithm work. And often iterative process where you do some feature engineering, you train the model, you see the outcome and you see its accuracy, and then you go back, do some more feature engineering and you repeat this process and you get a slightly higher accuracy and you keep going back and forth like this until you get an accuracy that you can live with, that you can actually use. There are also some algorithmic challenges, and this is very important to understand. So overfitting the training data. If the model is too complex relative to the amount of data present and the noisiness of the, of the data, um, we're talking about the training data, then the model might overfit to the training data. So this means that it performs very well on the training data, but it does not generalize well, meaning that it doesn't perform well on new data. So one way to solve this problem is to simplify the model by selecting one with fewer parameters or by reducing the number of features in the training data or by constraining the model. So all of these are approaches you can use to solve the problem of overfitting the training data, right? You don't want a model that essentially memorizes your training data um, because that means it can't generalize at all for new data. So it won't be that accurate for new data. So another way to solve this is by gathering more training data. So the more training data you have, you know, by that I mean the more instances or the more cases in the training data you have, not the more features, right? We're not talking about more variables. We're talking about more instances or cases that you might have in your training data. 
um, the more it's gonna generalize you know the better the model is gonna generalize another way would be to reduce the noise in the training data so go in and you know fix any data errors remove outliers so outliers are, are instances where you have like an extreme case an exception to the rule right and that could be throwing off or skewing your model it's worth removing those in some cases you shouldn't remove those so you should really understand your data before you do that but overfitting your training data is a very real problem that's why we also hold back a testing date or validation set um, so that we can actually validate our model after we train it technically you could train an almost 100 percent accurate uh, model on your training data but you don't want that because that means that your model basically memorized that data set and it doesn't know what to do with new examples or new data just as overfitting is a problem underfitting the training data set is also a problem if the model is too simple relative to the underlying structure of the data then that means it's underfit the training data so this means that the model doesn't perform well even on the training data so this is your classical example of an outright bad model like you know before you even got around to overfitting you know your model doesn't even work on the training data so uh, in in those cases you can select a more powerful model so that that's where it helps to know the different algorithms and to switch back and forth between them and r really helps to do that with ease and often by more powerful model we mean you know one that has more parameters that you can fine-tune or you can do some feature engineering on the data and better select the features you're supplying the model with and you can also re reduce the constraints on the model. So you can reduce the regu regularization. That's something we're gonna learn later on and so on and so forth. So these are all different ways we can fix the problem of underfitting the training data. Now, a typical machine learning project development flow looks like the following. So you would first frame the problem and look at the big picture. That's very important before you get into any of the details. And then based on that, you get the data you need. Sometimes it'll be given to you. Sometimes you have to go and find it. And then you have to really sit down and explore that data and gain insights. You know, this is where um, you'll gain insight into what the data means and which uh, features are actually important and which ones are not, which ones can be removed, which ones or what's missing, right? Maybe you might notice that, you know, there's, there are, there's a very important feature that should be a part of this data set that's missing, so on and so forth. So this is where you get all the insight into your data. This is also where you get ready for some pre-processing, which is the next step, prepare the data for machine learning algorithms. So this is where you do a lot of the feature engineering, the pre-processing, the cleaning up, all of that kind of stuff, get it ready for the machine learning algorithm. And then you train on a bunch of different models and you explore different possible, you know, different options for models and you know, based on the results and the accuracies that you get, uh, you can shortlist the best ones among all the different models that you tried. And then you can fine tune your model. So you play around with the parameters, you adjust um, certain um, hyperparameters, that kind of stuff. And so, you know, you're aiming for a higher accuracy and then you present your solution, right? That means because you've built your model and you've solved the problem and then you can launch or deploy your model to be used in production and build systems for monitoring and maintaining that system so this is how a typical machine learning project development flow looks like before i end let me quickly go into the framework that we're going to be using in r to build our models so r is a statistical programming language it's a language built by statisticians for statisticians right so this essentially means that it was built for machine learning. That you, there are a lot of built-in algorithms, uh, machine learning algorithms within R, and there are a lot of packages out there, a lot of packages for machine learning algorithms. R might be the most up-to-date language when it comes to you know machine learning. Um, whenever there's like a new paper published or a new algorithm you know discovered or something like that, um, you can rest assured that somebody will you know by the end of the day have a package up and running for that algorithm or for that new discovery or whatever it is. So there are a lot of packages. So depending on your domain in your particular field or your particular niche, uh, there might be a collection of packages that have been developed specifically for that you might, you know, 
uh, discover and start using. You know, I can give you an example from biology, for example, or bioinformatics or genomics, right? There are a lot of packages that focus on machine learning for just those fields or those subdomains. But in general, um, when you want to use machine learning to solve a, a whole variety of problems, R also provides a lot of packages for that, such as Carrot, MLR was a package that was popular at some time at one point. So there are a lot of packages like that. But uh, what we're going to be focusing on in this course is a relatively new set of packages. Hence, I'll call it, you know, a framework. It's essentially a collection of packages for modeling and machine learning using tidyverse principles. So tidy models comes from the same people that brought you tidyverse. And they're trying to do what they did with tidyverse when it comes to data science and and really, you know, creating a very nice ecosystem, a very nice philosophy for working with data, cleaning, you know, wrangling it, manipulating it, visualizing it, all of everything we saw in the previous sections. Um, but bringing basically that philosophy, that mindset to modeling and machine learning. So tidy models, just as tidyverse is not a package in, on its own. You know, it's a collection of packages like Diplyr and ggplot2 and tidyr and readr and stringr and all of that. Tidy models is also a collection of packages. So there's no package called tidy models, but there are packages that are part of that framework, such as parsnip or recipes, etc. So we're going to be focusing on tidy models. And the reason is that even though it's relatively new and there might be some issues with it at the moment, it is, you know, set to become the de facto machine learning framework for R, just as Tidyverse has become the de facto like data framework or data ecosystem for R. So there's a lot of benefit in getting acquainted with this for you right off the bat, because a lot of people have spent many years using other packages in R to do uh, machine learning. And so it, it's going to be hard for them to transition into something like tidy model. So it's very good that you, you'll be exposed to this right off the bat. And it's only going to get better from here because a lot of effort is being put into developing all the packages within tidy models at the moment. So a lot of new, you know, at the time of me making this video, there aren't any resources online that teach tidy models. Um, but you know, those will slowly start coming out uh, and eventually this will become a very popular framework with a lot of support. And so, uh, you know, it's definitely worth your time to learn. Um, now, some of the packages within the Titan Models framework are as follows. Our sample is a package that provides the basic building blocks for creating and analyzing resamples of a data set. So you often need to create samples. Like we, we, we mentioned an example for generalization you wanted to hold back a test data set and to use a training data set so you you have to basically sample your training data into test and a training data set and so you know that's a method of sampling like do you do it randomly and so on and so forth so all of you know all of those things that have to do with resampling um, can be done using the r sample package recipes uh, gives you a method for creating data encoding and pre-processing so this is what we're going we're gonna to be using for really formalizing our pre-processing steps so that you can also apply the same steps to new data as it comes in. So, you know, that, that really streamlines our workflow in that regard. Parsnip is the main machine learning package within Titan models. This is where you actually train your model. So it provides a tidy unified interface to models that can be used to try a range of models without dealing with underlying package details. So the biggest benefit of tidy models is that normally, you know, I mentioned that there are a lot of existing packages and algorithms or built in um, functions within R for machine learning, but each of these have been developed by another person. So each of them have their own conventions, have their own ways of, of being used and that kind of stuff. So it can become pretty tedious keeping track of, you know, which function uh, uses which method to define its data and, and and to define this parameter and that parameter and that kind of stuff. So Parsnip universalizes all of that. It gives you one convention that you use and in the back end, depending on the algorithm or the function or the package that's going to be using to train the model, it does that mapping for you. So you don't really have to know the details 
of the underlying package. It doesn't create its own algorithm. It uses existing algorithms, existing packages and functions, but it provides an interface for you to access those in a unified manner. Tune is another package within the Tidy Models framework, and it facilitates hyperparameter tuning for Tidy Model packages. Um, it relies heavily on recipes, parsnip, and dials, which is another package. That's where we can fine-tune the, the parameters of our models to increase the accuracy and, and that kind of stuff. We're going to see examples of that in the following sections. Yardstick is a package to estimate how well models are working using tidy data principles. Because again, there are a lot of packages out there that help you evaluate your models and they give you a lot of statistics or a lot of key information about the performance of your data. But each of them have different ways of presenting key performance of your, your model. And, but each of them have a different way of presenting to you these results. So it's very hard to streamline the process of evaluating your models. And Yardstick takes care of that. So here are some of the references I used to prepare this presentation. Uh, I will see you in the next section. Bye-bye.